There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. Well, good morning, guys. How you doing? Beautiful day out there. Sorry if you're a Packers fan. Sorry if you're a Ravens fan. Sorry if you're a Steelers fan. Sorry if you're an Eagles fan. Anyway. (laughs) Who cares about football? We're in church, right? Amen? Amen. Yeah, amen. Hey, welcome, everybody, though. Welcome online. So glad you're joining us as we are in week four of our Better series. And I'm very, very excited about today's topic. It is about how you and I are going to be invited to be in partnership with a God who loves the world and how we can be in partnership with him to make the world a better place. Beautiful, beautiful mission, beautiful calling. It's been a part of the core identity of Living Word from about as far back as you can go. Living Word has really been passionate about our, finding our role in God's global plan to make a difference in the world. Uh, I'm going to do three things this morning. I'm going to do the first two briefly and spend the majority of my time for the, uh, for the final one. Here's what I'm going to do briefly. I'm going to tell you a few facts about the world. Uh, it's important for you and I to understand the world and what's going on in the world and what God's doing in the world. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time. I could have spent the whole morning telling you about uh, how God's working around the world. Very, very exciting. I'll tell you just a couple of things. Uh, second thing now is we're going to take just a few moments to look at a few key scriptures. And once again, I could have spent all morning looking at a biblical basis for a world mission. Now, I mean, that's something that's just been so prominent living world. All I want to do is remind you about something and not spend too much more time on that. But there will be some more information in the sermon notes, some other texts that you can look at. And if you want to pick up a copy of the week devotional, every week begins with a particular global text that really emphasizes what God is doing around the world. The third thing, though, I'm going to spend the majority of our time with this. So how's living word working around the world? What's our strategy? What's our plan? What have we kind of discerned from God about the best way that we can make a difference in the world that God loves? So to get started, let me tell you a few things about what's going on in the world. And by the way, there's going to be a couple of diagrams, a few maps. All those things will be included in the sermon notes if you want to use that. So right now, the world's population is right around 7.8 billion people. We are moving toward 8 billion. I remember back when we were just like in the four, four billions, I'm thinking, man, I can't imagine what a, a war of 5 billion people would be. That was decades ago. We're shooting toward 8 billion people. Here's a little pie chart of what the uh, breakdown of the world's population is for, for religions. And you'll notice on this chart, and again, it's, uh, the details are there in your notes. You can see that more carefully probably later. But Christianity is still the world's largest religion. But if you look at this other group of religions, and we call them the unreached peoples, but the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, and folk religions, they actually make up a greater percentage of the world than what Christianity does. And so it is this unreached part of the world that is of great, great interest to all those who follow Jesus Christ. Uh, But anyway, that just gives you a sense of right now what those particular divisions are. The church is massive at places in the world. Do you know the world's largest church building is in Nigeria? It is called Glory Dome Church, and it has seats for 100,000 people. So just kind of imagine, you know, Beaver Stadium laid flat and with a dome over it, and that's how big that church is. Just immense. I tell you what, I, I, I understand why they call it Glory Dome. I bet they have some pretty amazing worship times there at that place. Can you imagine 100,000 seats filled? And actually, they said the seats are filled. People are standing in the aisles. I've just seen pictures of it. It's just it's simply, simply amazing. God's doing some pretty extraordinary things just in terms of sheer numbers of people becoming Christians around the world. All right, just one or two like kind of fun statistics, and we're going to get into a couple sobering ones. Uh, world's uh, number one tourist destination. Guess what country it is? All right, it's France. Now, this is pre-COVID, but France has nine, before that, we're having about 90 million visitors a year. By comparison, the United States, which is far, far bigger, we get about 80 million visitors coming into the United States. France just gets a massive number. And I know because I was there one summer visiting a missionary, and I said, hey, let's go see some sites. He said, you don't want to go see sites or places, a zoo, but we went to see the sites, and he was right. It was a zoo. I mean, it was like, I, I couldn't even get close to the Eiffel Tower. That's how many people were there uh, to see that thing. Um, by the way, if you're thinking about retirement, you probably don't want to retire to this country. This is the, the world's most expensive country in which to live, and it is a small one called Bermuda. So yeah, maybe enjoy going to vacation there, but you're probably not going to wind up retiring there. Okay, let me get now to a few things that are maybe a little bit more, a little more of interest and maybe sobering about, about global missions. 
So the country of China has 1.4 billion people. Actually, it's like 1.45 billion. India is right around the same. They're the two by far largest nations in the world with population. But in the Chinese uh, uh, country with 1.4 billion people, kind of how many Christians do you think live in that uh, amazing country? So I've got a couple of possibilities up there. If you were going to look and get a sense of how many Christians live in that place called China, you just what do you think? It's 100,000. You think it's a million? You think it's like astronomically big, 100 million? Okay, here's what God's done in China. There, there are probably 150 million Christians living in China. About 10% of China is Christian. Most Christians living in the United States have no idea about the work that God has done to expand his church in China in one of the uh, probably the most hostile places to religion that there is. Christianity has flourished. And by the way, you're not going to be a nominal Christian if you're going to be a Christian in China. Nominal has no place. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be a pretty serious, devout Christian. We're talking about a pretty amazing church that is growing in China. And observers are saying in the next couple of years, it's going to go up to 160 million believers in China. Now, by the way, you go look at official government stats, and the government stats are a whole lot lower because, frankly, it's kind of embarrassing for the Chinese government to say, oh, we got Christians everywhere. They just don't want to say that. But, but God is at work around the world doing some simply, simply amazing things. All right. Here's probably what we have to understand more than anything else. There's, there's a part of the world, it's called the 1040 window, and here's like, there's a rectangle box there. It extends to 10 degrees south of the equator and 40 degrees north of the equator. A vast amount of the world's population lives in that particular uh, 1040 window. Out of the 7.8 billion people in the world, 3.3 billion living in that area, they are the unreached peoples of the world. So just in that one kind of rectangle of the world, there are 3.3 billion unreached people. 96% of all the unreached peoples in the world, they're the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the folk uh, people, they live in that particular part of the world. Now here's why that's pretty staggering. There are about 340,000 missionaries in the world. Now there's lots more pastors than that. But in terms of missionaries, people who, who, who live in one culture, one nation, and they feel called by God to go to another different culture, there's about 340,000 missionaries. Of that number, only 14,000 of them are working in the 1040 window where 96% of the unreached people still live. That's 4% of all missionaries are working amongst the greatest mission field on planet Earth. Now, that alone should be some cause of some pretty significant concern for us that there's such a vast number of unreached peoples and there are so few people working there. I'm going to tell you what Living Word has thought about that from the very, very beginning. Okay, one more thing. Here's a map that is just showing some of the most dangerous places of the world to live. If you're a Christian and in those darker places, it's really, really dangerous. If you're looking at the notes, uh, the, the notes uh, uh, part of the app, I've actually got the top 10 countries listed. I will say this. Uh, North Korea has been the most dangerous country if you're a Christian to live in. Afghanistan has been number two. And uh, I've just been checking a couple of recent websites that, that keep almost like weekly tabs on, on what's going on. And they said, Afghanistan has jumped into the world's number one most dangerous place for Christians to live. And we can understand that with the regime change, that new regime is very, very militant against Christians. And Christians right now are in hiding as a really, really tough, if you were a Christian Afghan, tough, tough situation to be in. So again, those are some of the things that we just ought to be holding in mind as we're thinking about God's heart for the world and what God might be inviting us to be a part of. I do want to mention uh, there is a, a course called the Perspectives Course, and there's a group of really very thoughtful missional practitioners, people who teach about missions uh, in this area, and uh, every year they run a Perspectives Course, and we're going to have some information out there at our Next Steps counter. If you would like to really get informed about what God's doing in the world, the missional strategies to reach the world, this Perspectives Course is kind of like a college-level course, but it's, it's just made very, very accessible. Um, I think it's getting started really really, really soon. So if you're interested in this, you've got to go out there and get some information. I think we'll have some folks out there who can help you with that. But it would be a great way for you to just to kind of supercharge you know, your missions knowledge. It's the perspectives course. All right. Just a little bit about what's going on in the world. I could have talked for the next half hour. Let's shift for just a little bit and talk about what does God think about world missions? What's God's plan for world missions? And on your sermon notes, I've got listed about five or six of the major biblical passages, but they're only five or six. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible that tell us God's plan for the world. 
In fact, that's probably uh, probably uh, like an underestimate. It, uh, it probably safe to say there's more than a thousand verses in the Bible that talk about God's plan for the nations. Very very exciting. Now I'm not going to go over most of those. Many of you are familiar with them. You know, you know, blessed to be a blessing from the from Genesis chapter 12. Go make disciples of all the nations. Matthew 28. You know, you're going to go to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter eight. Uh, Acts chapter one verse eight. Lots and lots of scriptures we talk about. Let me mention just a couple from Jeremiah. And remember last week we talked about about those, Babylon, uh, those uh, Jewish exiles living in Babylon. And in verses one through nine of chapter 29, God said, man, here's where you're gonna be living. And I want you to seek the peace and prosperity and the flourishing of the city. I want you to live in such a way so that Babylon flourishes. I want you to, to pray in such a way that I bless Babylon. Now that's a pretty striking language. Now, we could have understood if the Jewish exiles, you know, if they were just people back in Jerusalem, if I got saying to the Jews in Jerusalem, hey man, I want you just to live and work and pray so that Jerusalem is blessed and Jerusalem has shalom and Jerusalem flourishes. But these are Jewish exiles that were now living in a foreign land that had conquered them. God says, oh no, I just want you to pray for that place. So, you know, last week I called them exiles. Let me give you a different definition for those exiles. How about if we look at them as resident missionaries? They are, they are people that they were God's people in Jerusalem. God has carried them away, and now they're going to be resident missionaries in a new land. God has additional plans for all these exiles, what he's going to do through them for the sake of Babylon, and actually for the sake of a lot of people outside of Babylon. It's just exciting. So in Jeremiah chapter, uh, chapter 3, there's one verse in particular where God is saying, I'm going to actually make Jerusalem a throne for the nations where they will come and worship me. And all those people who have been the enemies of, uh, uh, have been the enemies of my people, they're actually going to come. They're going to come to Jerusalem and they're going to worship me together. And wow, does, if that is not sort of like, like just this looking forward to Acts chapter one and chapter two, when all the nations are coming in, into to Jerusalem and the day of Pentecost happens, and we're going to get to that in just a couple of weeks with the book of Acts. But it's like this amazing prophetic vision of what God's going to do for all the nations. They're just going to be gathering in on Jerusalem to worship God. Uh, and then in uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 14, uh, there's, a, there's a sense that, that even these nations that have been really wicked, horrible nations, the nations that God says he's judged for their wickedness, he says, I'm going to forgive them, I'm going to heal them, I'm going to bless them, and I'm going to do that when they call upon my name. So again, just, you know, God has such a deep, deep heart for the nations of the world, for the peoples of the world that have actually been, been fundamentally opposed to his Jewish people. God loves those nations. He wants them to come and know the true God. Now, here's one that don't have listed in your sermon notes. And if you are in one of the life groups or if you're one of the mid-sized communities and you're going through this better series, I actually have this passage listed there. I, I want to mention this one to you. And I, I tell you, I need to mention it to you because... I mean, these are the kinds of passages that just help you know this book comes from God. No Jew in his right mind would have said these words. No prophet would have had the ability to say these words. What, what you're going to hear is so far beyond the typical Jew, even the best prophets, none of them could have envisioned these words. The only way these words could have been written is if God was given these words to, in this case, the prophet Isaiah, and say, Isaiah, write this down and be real clear. Now, it is in chapter, it is in chapter 19, and I, would, I, just, I could take the whole morning and just talk about this passage, but it's about, the, it's about Egypt, and it's about Assyria, two of those hostile empires that wrecked God's people. Two of these hostile empires that had their own gods that they worship. So there's Egypt in the south, and there is Assyria in the north. And I don't have time to, to go through all this, but, but, God, but God says, um, I'm going to send them a savior and a defender. I, I'm, I'm going I'm to help them acknowledge that I'm the Lord their God. I'm going to heal them. But as amazing as that is, here's, I mean, that maybe, maybe a really pious Jew could have maybe wrapped their mind around. Here's the next part that nobody could have gotten. So God says, there's going to come a day when there's going to be a highway. It's going to be starting down in Egypt, and it's going to run from the, from the, from the south, and it's going to come up, and it's going to wind its way. It has to wind its way through, through, uh, through the land of Israel. And it's going to wind its way up to the north of Assyria, and in that day, there's going to be a highway, and the Assyrians will go down to Egypt, and the Egyptians will go to Assyria, and the Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. Now, right away, so what are you talking about? 
I'm going to try and make this contemporary. You just have to hang with me on this because we don't always understand the impact that some of these things would have had on the people hearing it for the first time because we don't live in a culture. That would, in essence, be saying, okay, I'm going to have a highway going from the heart of communist China to the most radical Islamic world. And there's just going to be a highway where people are going back and forth between those two places, and they're going to come and worship together. And you say, what are you talking about? That is simply inconceivable. It gets better. I can find the right page, it gets better. In that day, listen to this. In that day, Israel will be third place. What? Third place. Along with Egypt and Assyria, they'll be in third place to be a blessing to the earth. You see, here's why no Jew would have ever said that. No prophet could have envisioned that. God's saying, Egypt, first place, Assyria, second place, Israel, third place, to be a blessing to the nations. And then he goes on and said, listen, and here it gets just, it goes, it soars. The Lord Almighty will bless them. Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, in that order. Bless them, saying, blessed be Egypt, Egypt, my people. Blessed be Raqqa Islam, my people. That's the kind of work I'm going to do. Blessed be Assyria, my handiwork. Blessed be the heart of communist China. I've got something I've got planned there. And Israel, my inheritance. Guys, we're going to sing a song at the end. We're just this unstoppable God who's doing unimaginable, uh, literally unfathomable things that are that the ways of the Lord, the thoughts of the Lord are so far and above ours, we can't even begin to wrap our mind around what God is doing unless we really start to pay attention. And by the way, that's what the prospectus course will help you do. That's what I'm trying to help you do a little bit. It's just so big. It's so radical. It's so beautiful. And God's saying, living word, you are part of my people and you got to join in with what I'm doing around the world. Okay. I could talk a whole lot more about the biblical basis for mission, but I just hope you have enough to understand that God's got some really big plans in store for the world he loves. So big, he sent his son Jesus to be a missionary savior. And so big that the missionary savior Jesus created a missional church. And Jesus is sending this missional church out to do all the good work, working with God in partnership to love and bless the the world that he loves. How is the living word a part of that? That's what I want to spend the rest of our time on. They'll tell you like six strategies, a couple of them, actually they're going to be all pretty brief. Just six strategies, kind of, kind of whet your appetite. Number one, it is a big world out there and we can't work everywhere. So Living Word has always been very particular in choosing a few places where we enter into partnerships. And we've especially wanted to do that amongst these unreached peoples we had a special burn for them because there were so few people going there. There was so much work to be done. Living Word said, we're going to prioritize that unreached, unfinished work of God. And when we go there, we concentrate so many resources that we actually start to, we, we, now we call them hubs. You know, hubs of spiritual resources, pulling together different partners, and, and we really want to make a difference in this place. It is a big world out there. We have to be highly, highly selective. And we have been selective. We have been especially selective about that 1040 window. And so over the years, we've had people work in Pakistan. We've had people work in Pakistan, reaching the people uh, living in Afghanistan. We have people work in multiple countries in the Middle East. We've had people working in, in Indonesia. And right now, one of the things that we've been targeting for the last couple of years is the largest Muslim, uh, Muslim people group in the world. Actually, it's the largest people group in the world that does not have their own country. They are a people group without a land. And they are known as the Kurds. And they live in multiple places in the Middle East. One of the places where they are concentrated is in the land of Iraq. And they are especially concentrated as you get into the middle and to the northern parts of Iraq. We sort of refer to that as Kurdistan. Now, that's not legal, that's not political, that's not on the map, but that's how the Kurds are thinking. They're just trying to stake out some land where they can wind up having a home and a place to call their own. And we are now working with this largest, without a land, people group in the world. In particular, we're working at a place called Sulaymaniya. And Pastor Brian Newman is our, our pastor on staff that's kind of coordinating a lot. He's been over there recently uh, two different times. Uh, we've got partners there. We support them for multiple years. They're doing amazing ministry with the family center. They've got a church started. They've got a Bible institute started. They're working with refugees. They're working with training women for jobs. I mean, they're just doing an amazing kind of work. And we really believe God is at work. They're doing something special. And we want to be a part of it. 
And we are starting to jump in there with more and more resources. And in fact, Brian Newman, along with Dr. Ed Nelson, were just there and just back, and they were scouting out the possibility of us taking a short-term group of people there, uh, kind of, again, exploratory, just seeing what kind of difference we can make. And we're pretty sure that we're going to wind up having a trip a little bit later on this year. Very, very excited about that. But see, that's what we wind up doing. We find these couple places and we build partnerships and we pour resources in there, especially amongst the unreached. And we just want to say, let's make a difference right here. Kind of like the language from last week, a pocket of greatness, finding our nook and corner cranny of the world. And there, when we find that, we're just going to do whatever we can to make a difference right there. And it's working really, really well. Leads to the second thing. And the second point is one of the reasons why we love what's going on in Sulaimania, And that is there's holistic ministry going on. Now, our value is holistic ministry, and by that I simply mean the gospel is big and the kingdom is big. And yes, the kingdom is all about uh, sharing the good news of Jesus and evangelism and helping people come to faith in Christ and then helping them be disciplined and grow into maturity and then gathering them together in churches and helping churches be planted and, and grow and, and strengthen and, and pl- have places of education. But we also wind up feeding the hungry and taking care of the poor and helping the sick. And we work with places where they, they're doing micro businesses, helping people start new kinds of jobs. I mean, just uh, medical work, the list goes on. We love this holistic approach to meet the needs of the people in as many ways as we can in these particular places and partnerships. Now, where we have done that, with, I'm just gonna say with excellence, with excellence and love is in Ethiopia. And we have a number of different partners that we've been working with in Ethiopia for many, many years, and we're seeing a lot of amazing traction. Pastor Aaron is our pastor and staff who is responsible for all the work going on in Ethiopia. And Pastor Aaron recently had a conversation with one of our our best missional partners there, uh, Dr. Freyu. And here we have a little video with a couple of thoughts from that conversation. Hey church, we wanted to take a moment and just share a quick story from one of our awesome missional partners in the country of Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is one of our most strategic hubs where we have strong and enduring partnerships. We partner with Ethiopian Outreach Ministry for evangelism, discipleship, and church planning. We have a sister church in Diradawa and also in Djibouti. And we have a major investment with Dr. Freyu and his Project Adoptive Village, or PAV. Many of us at Living Word have had the privilege to travel to Ethiopia and to connect with Dr. Freyu and his team and work alongside them. And we always come away so inspired. And although our missions trips to Ethiopia have been temporarily on pause because of challenging times in Ethiopia, we will go again. And in the meantime, we wanna pray and give like crazy for the work our partners are doing continues as strong as ever. I recently caught up with Dr. Freyu, who always has a story about people that they are helping. And this time, he told me about a man named Tesfai. Now, Tesfai is 71 and lives alone in Sendafa with no income. He's been a sad, lonely, and grieving man for many years. He spends his entire day laying alone on the dirt floor since he has no bed, and his little home is shabby and dilapidated. The roof was so worn out it continuously leaked whenever it rained. And the POV team met Tesfai while visiting HIV homes in his neighborhood. You know, they were in the process of selecting poor people whose homes were in bad condition and needed renovation. The POV team decided to help Tesfai and fix his home. Dr. Freyu told me the, the muddy floor of his house was dug and filled with stones. The floor was cemented, the walls were strengthened, the leaky roof was changed uh, with new metal sheets, vinyl was put on the floor. Uh, they bought him a bed and clothes and shoes and they took him to a clinic for medication that he desperately needed. Each month, they buy him food and other necessities. And Dr. Freyu said that the day they finished Tesfai's home, he raised up his arms toward the heavens and blessed the Lord and said, angels came to my house and changed it. Can you tell us a little bit about how Tesfai is doing now? Tesfai is doing very well at the moment. And um, every time we go to his home, uh, we usually go in the morning and uh, we find him out of his home, sitting in the sunlight and uh, enjoying life. And uh, he, he used to be a very uh, grumpy person. Now he smiles. He's, he has more hope. He's very happy. Living work, um, I love you so much. I mean, I, I don't even have uh, enough words to, to express my gratitude. Freyu told me this story with tears in his eyes. 
saying God renovates our lives so that we can then join Him in renovating our world. Isn't that what it is all about? Church, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Dr. Freyu is already telling a few of us about more people that they've met just recently who are living in desperate poverty, who they've been able to help with mercy, love in action, and the good news of Jesus Christ. I love all our partners in Ethiopia. You know, God has really blessed us with these wonderful partnerships. And you, the people of Living Word, have made their work possible through your faithful prayers and generosity. Thank you so much. Yeah, amen, amen, amen. By the way, uh, uh, we're going to try every month to bring you a different story from the places where we are working around the world. It's been so hard for us to get over there during this time of COVID, and we have just so missed being there. We've got to do a better job of bringing them here so we can just stay in touch with what God is doing through our friends and partners. But Testify is just, just one story of hundreds. I mean, because of that concentrated amount of resources that we have invested in that part of Ethiopia and Sandafa, literally, you know, a town has been changed, hundreds of lives have been changed, churches have been started, churches have been built, churches have been strengthened, pastors have been trained, students have been educated. Uh, I mean, it's just been an amazing amount of work going on because we have been able, by God's will, to concentrate amazing resources right there with some people that are doing amazing, beautiful, holistic ministry. Here's the third strategy. Man, when we can, we find the best nationals we can to work with. And we especially find nationals who are also really interested in doing leadership development wherever they are. So what do I mean by national? Well, Dr. Freyu was a national, for example. So Dr. Freyu, you know, he knew the language, he knew the culture, he knew the people. That was his home. So he was already positioned to do immediate, really good work. He was already doing good work. But what Dr. Frey did not have was resources. <clears throat> well, here's Living Word comes along, and we have resources. And so we get resources to Dr. Frey and his team. We get resources to Ethiopian Every Ministry. We get resources to, to Pastor Misaker. We get resources to the church in, in Djibouti. We get resources to those nationals who are already there positioned to do amazing work. They just don't have resources to do the, the stuff that God's calling them to do. And so that's where the partnership comes in. I mean, every place we've gone, we find a amazing nationals that we start to partner with, we go and say, hey, what are you doing? How can we help you do better what you're doing? We are here to be your servants. We are here to help you. We are not here so you can help us do the work there. We're here to help you. And I tell you, that kind of spirit and that kind of heart work with nationals, I mean, they just they become so grateful for the spirit in which we come alongside just to help and to bless. Now, I love the fact that so many of the nationals we work with, they love, they love and are called to doing uh, leadership training. So, I mean, multiple places where we're working, there are institutes for training. Let me just tell you about one, and that is down in Guatemala. And over the, over the decades, we've had many, many trips, dozens and dozens of trips, taking teams down to work with Mike and Terry McComb, working especially up there in Nibaj and working with the mountainous uh, parts of Guatemala. And we've gone down and we built churches and we built homes and we worked with pastors and we've done Christian ministry there. But one of the things that we're so excited about Mike and Terry McComb and their team is this place called Aselsi. And Aselsi is the acronym uh, for, for a Spanish phrase where it's basically a training institute. And to date, they have trained over 3,000 evangelists, pastors, and teachers, men and women uh, doing all kinds of work. And usually these people come from some of the poorest and least educated groups and they would have had no chance to get training and a CLC came into existence and they have done a phenomenal job of training now over 3,000 people. They actually have now six different locations. I'm sorry, six different countries. In some of those countries, they have multiple locations and they just keep on growing and growing. And it's just a privilege for us to be able to invest in the ministry of the Macombs in Guatemala, especially in a CLC, because of the impact. It's just this ripple waves of impact. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something that might stretch a little bit, and I'm okay if you get stretched. I'm okay if you get irritated. Just, you know, just talk to Jesus about your irritation. Don't talk to me. Talk to Jesus. <laughs> so I had a conversation with, with Mike. Uh, this is now a couple months ago, and I was just saying, hey, how things, you know, because COVID was horrible for, for Guatemala. It just wrecked the country. It, it shut the country down. Transportation stopped. And, and Mike said, wow, that was enormously hard on the villages in the mountains where we've gone, the very places where we've gone and we've met people and loved people and built churches for those people. And Mike said, you go to some of those places and, and like there are no men to be found. And I said, well, I, I said, what, what's going on? I'm assuming the men have all migrated down to Guatemala City looking for work. And he said There's, their, their families were starving. Literally, uh, their entire villages and towns, they were starving to death. So here's what happened. Many of those people joined that refugee train heading north, heading to the United States. 
He said, Brian, look, he said, I don't know what your politics are, Brian. In fact, I think he was almost like slow. He didn't, didn't know if he wanted to share this with me. He said, I don't know what your politics are, but, uh, but there are illegal immigrants from Aselsi that are now in the United States and they're planting churches. He said, you just have to wrap your mind around that. You know, I mean, we just look at all these bad, we think are bad things. And, you know, God, God looks at everything as an opportunity. I mean, God takes everything going on. We might have problems with it. God doesn't have problems with anything. God just says, I can take anything and use it. So now there are churches being started. There's actually a training, couple of training institutes going on now in the United States. And, and they're being staffed by these illegal immigrants that are finding these low-paying jobs, anything that they can do to earn a living, stuff that most Americans don't want to do. And they're, they're getting money. They're sending it back to their homes. And so their families are no longer starving to death because they're getting a little bit of income that they're able to send back. And by the way, they're starting churches. They're gathering together and they're leading other Latinos to Christ. See, that's how, that's just Romans 8. Yeah, amen, amen. That's Romans 8, 28 on a much bigger scale. And sometimes we can't imagine Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. We just can't imagine God using them. And God says, you ain't seen nothing yet what I'm gonna do. And we just have to have our hearts and our minds stretched so much bigger than our little paltry perspectives have. Man, I'm just so grateful for Celsius. It is just training thousands, and there are thousands more that are going to be trained, and we're going to keep on investing right there in Celsius. Okay, number four, we also like to, uh, one of our strategies is, is work with some of the poorest of the poor, and I'll tell you what, if there's a place that understands poverty, it's the Cuban church. And we've had the privilege, especially through Pastor Steve, of working in the Cuban church. We've seen the church planting movement started in the center of Cuba. We've done pastor training down there. But I tell you, over the last two years, because of the governmental system, there's been massive starvation going on in Cuba. And one of the things that we've done is we've just gotten resources down there for the Cuban church to get food, to start some food-based industry so they can not only survive themselves, but so they can have some resources to reach out for the unchurched neighbors. And we've just been committed to doing that. And we're just going to keep on saying, hey, one of the things that we can just do, it's real basic, it's real simple, but it is so beneficial. Let's just get money down there so they can buy some food so they can just survive. And as we do that, the gospel expands and the word goes out and the church grows and beautiful things happen. And so again, that's just, we just have a heart for the poor of the world because God has a heart for the poor of the world. Strategy number six, we love the church. We love the local church. Every place we've gone, we love to work with the local church. And I can tell you stories in all these different places where we're working with the local church. Let me just tell you one. And that is our partners, Jeff and Kathy Phillips and Gabe and, and Mildred and Eric and, and Deborah down in, in uh, the Santiago area of Chile. And, and they've all been here. You've, you've met them and you've seen them and they've led worship and Jeff has spoken. And man, I tell you, they, they have just a beautiful church planting movement. Uh, Gabe, the son, has become, uh, the, over the last two years, has become the lead pastor of the flagship church in that whole church planting movement. And COVID has wrecked Chile as well. Things have been shut down, and we have helped them get resources so they could especially do a better digital product. And he said they have just grown and grown. They're getting word out because we've been able to resource them with what they needed to not just be on site when they couldn't, but to start pushing word out. He says, exciting. This really, though, jazzed me up. So they themselves struggle with limited resources. But a couple years ago, we were just talking about, you know, what our Christmas Eve offering is all about. And we learned from another church out in the West about, about you know, just bl blessing others, just giving it all away. And so, you know, one of the things we started doing is we would send somebody down to help their church. So here's what they decided to do. Even though they themselves were under-resourced, they said, hey, we're going to take a Christmas Eve offering for the purpose of world missions. And, and, and this year, Gabe said they got like double the amount of money that they were anticipating. So Living Word was a model for them to start a Christmas Eve offering just to give it all away to others who are even needier, and that's exactly what we did. And by the way, here's just the beauty of God's kingdom. We're all working together. And I said, Gabe, you know, Living Word is giving you guys this much money for these particular projects, and he was just like so grateful. Do you see, isn't it beautiful how blessing works? Blessed to be a blessing. God has been so generous with you, and he blesses us, and then we bless people's everywhere. And they turn around and say, we just want to bless other people. God's kingdom is so beautiful. God's ways are so beautiful. And God's just thank you so much for being a part of that. Now, here's the last strategy. All the others were what's going on out there. Here's what we're doing right here. God, I just want you all to be better Christians this year. <laughs> better Christians. I, you know, so we started this series with a better you. Well, one of the ways that you will be a better you is by you becoming a, one of God's globally minded followers. And that means, first of all, you got to pray. Now, by the way, if you'll look at the sermon notes, I have got all kinds of resources in there. There's a link in there for you to go and learn about unreached peoples. It's called the Joshua Project. We've got a link in there where if you will text to this particular phone number for Living Word, you will have a link where you can wind up getting our monthly prayer guide. We have a monthly prayer guide, global and local, where we spotlight different of our mission workers over there and right around here. Man, I tell you, when I talk to people, every time they say, please pray, would you please pray for us? 
are people praying for us? And I said, yes, we are. We've got a great team of people. I would love to have another 100 people, another 500 people just sign up and get this prayer list and say, that's one thing I can do right here. I can pray for the world and it'll be beautiful. We'll give you updates in terms of what's going on. Please do that. But man, we have supported our global program um, for a long, long time, not out of our general budget. The general budget supports right here and our general budget supports all the local stuff we're doing right here. But our global budget supports all the work we're doing in these wonderful hubs of partnerships out there in the world. And in the past, we've called it Faith Promise. Then we switched and started calling it Greater Things because of Jesus' promise to do greater things around the world. Uh, lately, we're just kind of more referring to it as our global reach project, our global reach budget. And thank you so much because there are so many of you who have been so generous to being a part of that particular, you know, you've just had to designate certain amounts of money going to that. And thank you for that. And I tell you what, every time people make an increase who are already faithful, we are so grateful. But, you know, there's a whole lot of people that you haven't quite had the chance to jump on board and helping us fund the great global things that God is doing because there's more we'd love to do. And if you'd like to, I would just really encourage you to go to uh, all the information is right there. You can go and sign on board and get to become a part of that as well. Guys, I just want to pray. We have a little bit of worship left. I'm going to come back up and give you a final benediction. Lord, uh, right now, um, thank you for our friends around the world. Thank you for the good work that they're doing. Thank you for your plans to bless the world and to bless the nations and to use churches like Living Word to be a part of that. God, we're humble and we're grateful for the beautiful things that you have done uh, through our commitment to world mission. And so, no, Lord, in, in this coming year, would you make it even deeper and stronger? Um, God, right now, fill our worship. Uh, may we really, once again, realize you're the God of the nations, and we love you so much.